Thank you very much. Okay, I just testing the equipment here. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Selamat pagi. Um, dear distinguished guests, dear audience who is watching on YouTube or Facebook online, um, I'm very excited, very happy to be here this morning because biodiversity is something that's very close to my heart. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the library for not just inviting me to share my ideas about what we can do with uh, citizen science at USM, but also to organize this amazing event and come up with a video just now. I have just seen it the first time. Um, so thank you very much for all your efforts. This is really amazing. I want to just say thank you again. Um, so yeah, why USM Campus Nature Challenge and why si citizen science and why open science? I think many of these maybe concepts or words are um, not yet quite familiar to all of you. So I just want to take this opportunity just to explain just a little bit more before we delve into the actual biodiversity of USM campus. And I'm sorry, I have to watch the slides because I'm used to having my laptop in front of me. So, <laughs> um, so libraries um, are a very important community hub for all of us, um, regardless whether we are citizens of the campus or citizen scientists or just citizens, like we are all. Um, we, I think as a child, I do remember vividly spending most of my free time in my little town library that was long before, you know, Facebook and TikTok. And so we were like looking for books and we just spend time in, you know, indulging into new topics and themes um, through books, through audio, whatever we got in our library. So coming back to now, coming back to our modern days, I think especially the younger generation might not as much appreciate what opportunities libraries give to all of us. And in an now this digital, di digital era, I think it's also a challenge for the libraries to be more, to still be attractive and to be more open and outgoing to um, especially attract young people to come back in. So here in USM, I guess many of our students, they have to, otherwise they can't great, they can't score. <laughs> but I'm just thinking about my own children, like whenever I talk about libraries, Allah, Bostan, Lord. So I think this is a great challenge. And so this is why I really appreciate um, what our library is, is coming up with to draw everybody in, regardless of whether it's USM students and staff, or just opening this up um, in an online mode now to, to share. Um, citizen science is, as per definition, and I'm taking this uh, definition that you see here from the Acad uh, Academia Science uh, Malaysia, uh, is the involvement of people from all walks of life in research activities. Citizen science calls for direct lay, layman involvement in research to encourage active public involvement Citizen-driven, crowdsourced, participant-led, participant-centric means we all are taking part and we are important taking part. And participant-driven participant research. Since citizen science projects invite the public to participate in a scientific investigation, this also offers the public with fertile opportunities for scientific learning. So this goes both ways. And I think this is very important that we, as scientists, um, I regard myself as a zoologist. <laughs> I'm a senior lecturer at School of Biological Sciences. I work a lot with animals. But as a scientist, of course, I do appreciate data that comes in from the public. And in my own research projects, we do get information from the public that helps me with my science. But at the same time, when we talk to the public, I think through really involving in these projects, many people learn a lot. And many people get not just information, but they get very passionate about a subject. And I think that's very important because if it's just about information and knowledge, it's probably not gonna go very far. But if somebody involves in a project and gets very passionate about it, very emotional, very driven, then we can go far as scientists and as a public. And I think this is what I'm gonna focus a bit more now in the times of, we call the Anthropoc Anthropocene, I don't know if you heard that uh, term before, we are living in an era of human impact where development, human development is posing big challenges to biodiversity. So in this era, I think we all need to take part in protecting what is left. And this is why we're here today. And I think everyone again being here is, is 
very important for making an impact. So why biodiversity? I must say, I, when was that? A few years ago, I have spoken to some people in our campus, not biologists, but yeah, from, I can't remember, physics, engineering, something not related to biology. And somebody asked me quite blatantly, and I'm like, well, we are all part of biodiversity. It is not us and biodiversity. We are part of biodiversity. And when you look at how every living thing is interconnected in these intricate pathways of ecological services, of take and give, um, taking one component out, meaning losing one species or one taxa, might have severe impact, not just on other species relying on that species, like we're losing a plant, then animals feeding on that plant may not have enough food. But in the long, in the long run, if you go down these pathways, it might also have significant impacts, negative impacts on humans. And that's what we are actually already seeing today. And I think everybody just needs to get a bit more aware about what is happening in our daily lives. We are part of biodiversity, but we humans rely heavily on biodiversity. Everything we eat and wear, cotton, for example, everything we do, our, our, um, our products are probably made of biological um, sources. So when you look at just some, some short points given here, ecological services, of course, regulate our climate yeah, we're not going to talk even about the impacts of climate change on our planet at the moment. I don't know if you have heard the news, but we are currently experiencing the hottest average global temperature ever recorded. Last week, uh, July 5th, was the hottest day ever recorded on the planet, not in Malaysia, on average globally, and that is concerning. So losing biodiversity means losing regulating uh, mechanisms that can help us to mitigate the impacts of climate change in the future. Of course, we're talking about waste management. We're talking about also about very important services like pollination. Everything we eat, our agricultural crops need to be pollinated. I hope we have the chance later to go down and look at the stingless bees in EcoHub, very important pollinators as well. Um, yeah, of course, we, we need pure water. I don't know how this works. Pure, pure water, uh, we need to um, have the nutrient cycles, which we are talking about phosphorus, nitrogen, um, carbon dioxide, talk back about climate change. All these cycles, they need to be intact so that we can, um, we can have the services that we expect from nature. Materials, food, fuels, I've mentioned that, but also very important, opportunities for enjoyment of the outdoors. And I think this is something we all also don't appreciate very often, and I think it came back to us during the lockdowns, when all of a sudden we couldn't go out, when many of us were locked, literally locked into their apartments. And thank God if we had a balcony. Some of us may not have a balcony. So what did many do? Started potting plants, starting, right. Mental health is a huge topic at the moment. We are all, every day, I think, having some interaction with someone who might be not well. Mental health, depression, burnout. If we, you just think about, and this sounds, sounds so trivial, but if you just think about, go out and take a deep breath in the forest, in the park, in just the neighborhood, everything on campus is green. Just walk around Tasik Harapan. <sighs> Habis stress can all the day stress can be gone. Yeah, don't go straight back into traffic jam one hour on the br <laughs> Penang Bridge. Go out first. At least look up in the trees. Look up in the canopies. We have beautiful rain trees on campus. Every time I look up, I go like, ah, so beautiful, right? So you can forget about your stress just for a little while. Um, yeah, quick facts. Um, I don't know, the slide is maybe not very good. I'm just going to run through this. Why we have to really think about how to protect biodiversity. And I think I can't even read it from here very well. Um, we, as humans, consume 7,000 plant species globally. I mean, species means 
different types of plants that are crucial for not just our main products. Like, of course, in Asia, it is rice. In my in Europe, in my countries where I come from, it's uh, wheat, gandum, or even potatoes. But when you look at all the different plant species we're eating, 7,000 different plant species. 70% of the world's poor live in rural areas and depend heavily on biodiversity for their livelihoods and well-being. Yeah? Even in Malaysia, Orang Kampung, Tanam, Chuchula, the Blakang, Ruma, everything, right, is, is very, very important, especially for the, the um, rural areas where agriculture and, and um, food products is, is, a, is a, an important form of income or livelihood. 1.6 billion people rely on forests for their livelihood. So not just talking about agriculture or farming, but natural forests like we see just outdoors here. Timber, timber, uh, non-timber forest products, um, hunting, substantial hunting for um, especially the indigenous communities also in Malaysia. So worldwide, 1.6 billion people rely on forests that are intact. Cities, coming back to Penang, cities consume 75% of natural resources. 75% of everything that we need that can the planet give to us is consumed inside or in cities, in, in urban areas. And of course, most of the population currently on the planet is living in urban areas. <coughs> Valuing biodiversity. So we talk about why we all should have that. And I think something I realize very often, the only language many humans understand is money. <laughs> Now, it's also how we want to protect biodiversity is what's, what's it worth, right? I don't know if this is a very current estimation, but I don't think it changed much. Ecosystem services alone are worth 200 billion US dollars per year. Means if we were to lose these services, for example, clean water, forests provide, uh, it's a water catchment area, they're providing the, not just the source of, <coughs> I'm sorry not just the sources for the water, but also the cleaning mechanisms. If we have to pay for the natural services in many aspects, globally and taken together, this would come to an, a staggering amount of 200 billion US dollars. Um, in 1997, a global study valued ecosystem goods and services at roughly 18 trillion US dollars so ecosystem uh, goods, 18 trillion US dollars, and ecosystem services, 61 trillion dollars, respectively. Now we're talking money. <laughs> so we need to protect, and not just for our well-being, be because what nature provides is priceless. Uh, it's, it's expensive. Human impacts, currently 85% of all fisheries are overexploited. We are already losing very important fish stocks worldwide. 50% of wetlands have been already destroyed. 70% of coral reefs are threatened or have already been destroyed. If you look up about the Great Barrier Reef in uh, Australia, the largest, actually the largest living organism on the planet that can be seen from space because a coral reef is a living organism. It's not just batu batu. 17% of all coral reefs worldwide have already been destroyed. Now this is hard to read, I'm sorry. 32% of species so far assessed by the IUCN, which is the global organization to assess uh, threatened species, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, 32% of all species worldwide are threatened already with extinction. And in Europe alone, um, it's 15% of mammals, 13% of birds, and so on. So it's a lot. It's one third of all species existing worldwide are currently on the verge becoming extinct in maybe the next 10 to 30 years, depending on the species. Climate change is said to be one of the major drivers of species extinction in the 21st century, with an additional 20 to 30 percent of species being lost soon. So I don't want you all to be depressed. <laughs> and because being depressed will get us nowhere. And I think you are not, because you're here. You kind of want to contribute, you want to make an impact, you're interested. So let's talk about what we all can do to maybe at least take part in, you know, take a, a small step in mitigating some of these impacts. Uh, sorry, what's the slide? Okay. Citizen science, as I just said earlier, um, is something everyone can contribute in. And recording the, the biodiversity, not just on campus, but if you're interested later on anywhere you go, is of course not just um, something that you do for your own 
interest, but in the long term can contribute also to the sustainable development goals. And if you look at for what USM is currently um, holding as, as her agenda, the um, ranking just this year for the THE ranking, the impact ranking, um, we are currently fourth worldwide. And that's something I'm quite proud of because sustainability is something close to my heart. But when you think about what else can we do, we can go further, we can do more, <laughs> always. Um, so this project can directly contribute to the SDGs, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And number four is called quality education. So all our students, all our staff, all our members here, of course, by contributing to this project, you also directly contribute to quality education for all our, our members, all our campus citizens. Um, SDG 15, obviously live on land, recording biodiversity. We maybe next year can go to CMAX, record marine biodiversity. <laughs> this year we start, start here, start small. Um, SDG 11, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Of course, if you improve biodiversity in, in Georgetown, in, in Penang, in Glug or anywhere around this campus as well, um, it contributes to the uh, safe cities, sustainable cities and communities. Um, SDG 14, I've mentioned, well, marine biodiversity, maybe not so much on land, but it also includes aquatic organisms. I think when you go to Tasik Harapan, you might see some fish, you might see, you know, all right. Uh, SDG 13, climate action, obviously I've mentioned that, um, take urgent action to combat climate change. So we educate people, we talk about it. And then SDG 17 is partnership for the goals. We all work together and we all try to take part in in uh, strengthening, strengthening the means of implementation of these sustainable development goals. Okay, why Malaysia? Mala I, hope, I, hope, I hope everyone is aware, because sometimes when I speak to people, even in Malaysia, they go like, oh, why biodiversity? Because Malaysia is a biodiversity hotspot. Why, Dr. Nadine, why you come here study monkeys? Ma, da ada monyet, ka, di German, da elu. Da ada monyet, di German, da ada. <laughs> Maman, da ada. <laughs> Maybe like, 2,500,000 years ago, I don't know, but yes, we don't have any primates, we don't have many of the mammals. If you go to our forests that are cultivated now, monocultural timber forests, the best you can see is wild boar and maybe some deer, if you're lucky. You go down Eco Hub, I'll show you later what you can see. <laughs> so Malaysia alone has, oh, I'm sorry, 785 bird species, um, currently 307 recorded mammal species, 242 amphibian species, 50, 60, 567 reptile species, 1,951 marine and freshwater fish, and more than, more than 15,000 vascular plants. And here we don't even have insects or fungi. Dr. Rasnida is here, fungi on it. So short, short snapshot, but these numbers are impressive. So Malaysia is number 16 worldwide in terms of biodiversity, in terms of number of species of different um, organisms, including mushrooms, including invertebrates, vertebrates, and also plants. A uh, university in a garden. This concept, I think it was on the first slide, I forgot to mention it. This concept obviously is very important for what we are doing um, launching today this nature challenge, but it has gone back um, with quite a visionary um, idea by um, Tanz Rizul, our former vice, vice chancellor, I think in 2001, where conceptualizing a campus in form of a garden is not just bringing, is it the next slide though? I'm only saying this now. No, it's not just um, bringing us beauty, but I think it is what I said earlier, it is engaging our creativity, it's engaging our thinking, it's engaging us to interact with our surroundings, interact with nature. So it's something that I think all of us value very much as long as we have been here in USM. And I, I bring new guests in. Yesterday we had a program also with Antigmoin students from UK, from Kiel. They came first time on campus here yesterday. We were walking around Tasik Harapan, we were walking down Eco Hub. And the students were just, oh my God, this is amazing. I want to stay here. Can I eat this fruit? Can I eat this plant? What is this bug? One got bitten by the kranga. <laughs> <laughs> she was not very happy. But um, genuinely, everyone is, is very, very amazed when they f the first time they come on campus. So 
What do you guess? How many species of different organisms have so far been recorded on campus? And that includes everything you can think about. What do you think? Any guesses from the audience? How many species, different species? Some of you might not be familiar with the species concept, but let's just say, how many species do you think we have recorded so far in USM? 400, next guess, I take bits now, 1,000, <laughs> next bit, next bit. 700, okay, that's a lot, 700,000. Uh, who's closest gets, get some uh, candies? <laughs> okay. We have so far recorded 959 species of different organisms, that does include plants, insects, mushrooms, plants, birds, anything. So, this is a project, and now you see it already, this is a citizen science app application, it's called iNaturalist, and um, I have been first, I came first in touch with this particular app in 2017 when we did the Penang Hill Bio Blitz, I don't know if anyone is familiar, Dr. Rashida, Dr. Rosnida, all were involved. iNaturalist is a platform that has been created by the um, California Academy of Sciences together with uh, National Geographic, and it's an app, an easy, friendly, user, um, friendly, user-friendly. Oh my God, the word user-friendly app, where everyone can participate in order to record biodiversity. So what I did was, um, I'm sorry, this is the next slide. What I did in 2017 when I knew about this app, I said, this is amazing. I need to teach my students how to use it, because my students, I teach uh, first-year students biodiversity. BOI 115, anyway, great assignment. Give them all, 200 students. Give them all the assignment. You go out, you record biodiversity on campus. So for the past years, I mean, not during COVID, unfortunately, the students mostly, and in Muin, of course, our top observer here, <laughs> he and the students, uh, we recorded these 959 different species all over the main campus. And when you and I want you to engage with the app. So later on, if you have free time, you just go into this project, Biodiff Bio University Science Malaysia. You can explore, you can explore everything that, that we have recorded already, and add your own um, observations to that as well. In EcoHub, just down here, Intik Muin also created his own project, which is specific only to EcoHub, and of course, he's again, our top observer, has come up with really, really interesting species because it's very focused and, of course, he spends a lot of time there. So please go to the projects in INET and please explore. And I'm going to show you some photos in a moment. How to use iNaturalist? Well, I think, I hope all of you have maybe had a look already, but for those who are listening online, I just want to explain a little bit more. iNaturalist, as I said, is this international community. It's a community of citizen scientists, currently with um, two, over 2.7 million people involved in that. 2.7 million worldwide use iNaturalist. They have recorded more than 147 million different species on the planet. Okay, uh, sorry, observations, that's not true. Uh, I have made these observations, but we have, or they have recorded 400,000 species. In order to participate, you just need to download the app and create an account, and everything is explained. It's quite easy to follow. So you will submit your photos or your sound records. You can also record sounds of a bird if you don't see it. Sound files or audio files, you can basically upload to iNaturalist, and these are called observations. So an observation is any encounter, any record of any um, animal, of any plant, any mushroom that you see. And the good thing is you don't have to know what it is. You don't have to know what it is, and that is the best thing. Even if you don't know if it's like a reptile or it's a snake, it doesn't matter. You just go and submit your observation. And people, the community in iNaturalist will help you to identify it. So you need to download your, uh, you need to upload your account or create your account. Take a photo of what you saw, and then in, inside you can see suggestions and the um, AI or the algorithm to identify photos is quite good. So they will give you suggestions if it's a flower, if it's a rose, if it's even the species, it probably can identify it if you have taken a very good photo. Um, usually now we are all using our handphones. You can also, uh, you with 
taking a photo on your handphone, it should already have a GPS tag to it, and of course the time recorded, so it's automatically gonna be assigned in iNaturalist, but sometimes manually you can add your um, time and also your location where you saw this observation, and any kind of evidence. But I'm gonna show you a video in a second because it's easier. If you go to the website, there's an easy explanation, not just for Android, but for iPhone or how you use it from your, um, from your laptop and from your DSLR camera. So I'm not gonna go into detail because everyone can, can look how to use it. But I just want to play this very short one minute video. Um, Felipe, can you? Is that video? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, the video should just play from the. It's a Vimeo, Vimeo file on top. Double click. Mm, okay. Technical difficulties. Okay, it's okay. I think we skip it because I think all of you can just watch how to do it. So you take your phone, you take a photo, you upload it to the app, and most of it will be assigned automatically. What you can do is you choose your organisms. Okay, we can go further. Okay. And I think we can do some hands-on practice outside an eco-hub in a moment. So now this USM Campus Nature Challenge. Why, why uh, the name? The name is because from iNaturalist for many years they are running a city nature challenge. And we couldn't quite fit their timing because of you know, semester and, and things. But we take inspiration from the City Nature Challenge and want to conduct this USM Campus Nature Challenge, which is also called a Bio Blitz. A Bio Blitz, the German for not Blitzkrieg, <laughs> a Bio Blitz is like a very quick short assessment of biodiversity on a site. And uh, in order to entice people to participate, we will also give some prizes. So, Everyone who participates will become eligible to be picked out of hopefully many, many people. Um, and the first prize, and um, you can read the rules and everything in, in the, um, the QR code here, but the first prize will be 200 ringgit. So students, staff, please, please sign up. So this is who is basically submitting the most exciting, most rare species. Um, is the first category and the second category will also give a prize for the best photo. So even if some of you have found a very common species but you have given us a beautiful photo artistically, then you will also be able to win prizes. But you, what you have to do is you have to basically sign up with Google Forms so that we can track everyone. And then must um, put your entry, of course, into the iNaturalist app. So not send email to us of your photo or not send like WhatsApp to the library, say I have done this. No, it must go through iNaturalist. And you must add your photo and location information as well. And only observations made on Minden campus at the moment are gonna be um, entertained. But of course, for your fun um, and own experience, you can take observations anywhere. However, for this campus nature challenge, in order to win prizes, yeah, it must be from campus. But we really hope that everyone's gonna engage with the app beyond the nature challenge. And so we have set up a project inside the iNaturalist app where you can submit your observations. I'm gonna show you the project. Um, if you can identify whatever you saw, that is fantastic. As I said, you don't have to, but try as, as good as you can, not just put animal, but maybe say it's a bird. Yeah, maybe we can go this far. Okay, that would be nice. Okay, so what to do? Quick, just quick, download the app, go to the project. It's called USM Campus Nature Challenge. You can see it under projects, in, depending on what you're using, your laptop, your um, iPhone, or your Android. It looks slightly different, so I'm just gonna give it here as a generic. You're gonna search under projects for USM Campus Nature Challenge and just enter and become a participant or member of that project. And that's it. Everything you're submitting then will be counted for the Nature Challenge. Then you observe anything you see, anything big or small or yellow or white, <laughs> you observe and take a beautiful photo of it and add it to the project. And then you can, as I just said, you can see how much you already know about it. Do you know this is the, uh, 
I don't know, now I don't have a name. But if you don't know the species, you just here, when you click and submit your observations, um, there usually comes a pop-up where it searches for, or the identifying uh, algorithm searches for the organism itself and it gives you some ID. So you can say, yes, I think this is really the, um, what is it? Give me, give me a good species. <laughs> Yellow vented bulbul. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, one important thing. It is allowed to take photos of potted plants also on campus. It's also allowed to take photos of our kuching, kuching sayang, and our anjing lia, not so sayang, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think we, sh we all should be mindful that we, are want, we want to rec record wild biodiversity. So if you have a photo of a potted plant, that is fine. You can submit it, but please, there's a tick here. Oh my God, this, sorry, this is not so easy to handle. But please click on captive or plotted means uh, cultivated. Cultivated plants or captive animals. Students also have given me their photos of their hamster in a cage in Takun. It's allowed, but it's not really what we're looking for. Yeah. Also, it is allowed to take a photo of your friend and say, human. <laughs> <laughs> it is allowed, but it's not what we're looking for. So if you want to win this competition, you better don't give us <laughs> your hamster or your best friend or the kuching in bhakti or something like that. Okay. All right. So try to find wild animals, wild plants, wild mushrooms, and then repeat. Um, take as many good photos of as many different species, different um, individuals, and submit. There's no limit to how many observations you can submit. It can be endless, but of course, um, shouldn't be the same all the time, right? Um, yeah, so this is, I think I mentioned this already, you can, QR code is now everywhere and abundant, but this is how the... Um, project site looks in iNaturalist. So this is the banner, this is the campus. Here is still clear. Yeah, remember the, f the slides before, I showed you all the different dots, 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 dots. This is kind of like it's an overlaid project. So it's the same area, but because it's um, a new thing we're doing right now, it's still empty. Today we can start uploading our observations already. Your observations should be made from today on until the, until the 31st of August. Um, Ideally, yeah, if it's from last year, we don't accept. If it was from yesterday, mm, you can took a photo yesterday, you upload it today. Oh, Lila, good. Okay. Um, so what to do? Take a clear photo, please. Clear photo of anything you see, plants, fungi, animals, insects, small or big. Potted plants or pets must be marked as cultivated or um, captive. Tag the exact location of your observation. Now, as I said, if you take it from your iPhone or from your Android and it's with GPS on, you don't even have to do anything. It's automatically going to be uh, registered in iNet where you took the photo. You don't know the species, that's okay. Yeah, just leave it as animals or plants Yeah, here. Otherwise, there's a pop-up with a very particular species maybe showing up. But it's okay, we will curate, we will help you. We is like the library and I and Jimuin and everyone here. Okay. Um, next, make your ob observations throughout the states. And please do not, <laughs> do not take pictures of food. I know it's enticing or market produce. You think, you know, it's like something is very clear to all of us, but when we, ha we ran the City Nature Challenge, we, we went to high schools in Penang, we talked to high school students who all participated before COVID in the big, big INET City Nature Challenge. They were amazing. They took so many different photos of so many different things. Dalam Tupuna, the French fries. <laughs> you know, they went to Tesco, Sawi, Tomato. No kidding, this is why I put this here. So only wild, wild and... Um, however, if there's a f an orchard uh, down in Eco Hub, right, there is, of course, there's wild uh, fruits, then of course, these ones you can take. Do not upload observations made by others, <laughs> please. So use your own photos, don't, don't take photos from the internet. Do not upload observations that are blur and unclear, like cannot rec recognize what it is, yeah, make very clear and nice photos, please. Don't guess species if you don't know what it is. It's fine to just leave it blank. We can, we can search for it and look um, for the correct species. And last but not least, do not upload the same observations multiple times. So if you have the same photo, it's one observation, it's one record. Don't like put it many, many times because 
going to be hard for us as judges to, to go through all of it. Okay, so now I think now this is the exciting part. What can you find on campus? So questions to the audience. And in Chimuin, Changan Chakap. What do you think you can find on campus? Tupai. Tupai? Eagle? Bewak, Bewak, okay. Sorry? Ula, Ulat. Ulat, Ulat. Kalulut, Kalulut. You give very, very diverse answers. I'm very happy. Thank you. When I ask my students, first answer, Bewak. Even the students from Kiel, from the UK yesterday, the first time on campus, I asked them, what do you think you can see? This dragon? <laughs> okay, I think what we all know, and uh, there was one slide, I'm sorry, I had some technical issues before one slide was missing. I think what we all, uh, when we think about USM campus, the first thing, and we talked about it earlier, is what you can see is what? Big trees, right? So you can submit observations of your trees. There's actually, a, there's a good tree map um, on the USM website already. I showed it before, sorry, really technical issue, that slide went missing. Um, what you can see on campus, big trees, and Enchik Muina scale. <laughs> this is kind of one of the, the biggest ones. Is that the Angzana? Yeah, okay. So I think we need to appreciate also how old these trees are. Ah, Dr. Rahman is here, right? Here. If you have any specific questions about trees, you talk to Dr. Rahman. <laughs> he is our uh, arborist. Bewak, of course. And all these common birds, rock pigeon, I think everybody knows. This is an invasive species, the African giant snail. So these are the top observations in the current iNaturalist campus app and all these different birds. But I think when you look around, it's kind of, yeah, I saw this, I saw that, I'm familiar. Now I want to show you some things maybe you're not so familiar with. Fabulous fungi, Dr. Rosnida, um, she can tell you everything about fungi. She is, I think you have published a book some time ago also, right, about the, the fungi on uh, campus. So this is like four out of, I don't know, can you tell us how many species currently on campus? Or roughly? More than 20 different species of mushrooms, fungi on, on campus. So currently, who jangan? Everything is sprouting. So you go out, you take photos, so nice. Curious critters, ah, Dr. Nick Ewan can tell you everything about the spiders and maybe some of the insects here. What is this? In, 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 in proper citizen science language? <laughs> Sorry? It's a jumping spider. Actually, these are quite cute. I am quite scared of spiders, but I like these. Samut, yeah, and they're, what is Jimuin uh, the, the eggs, is this butterfly eggs? Assassin bug, okay. Ah, Daniel the Nick, okay. Assassin bug. A fly, okay. See, I also don't know. And this one? Beetle. A beetle, okay. Well, I think everyone, if you just go and look very closely, and the secret sometimes is to just sit somewhere silently and don't like walk around, you will see all these really colorful, colorful, beautiful insects. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> smile, smile. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have amphibians, we have reptiles, we do have snakes. I heard just yesterday from the Kiel student who's doing her internship with Inform, there's uh, supposed to be snakes um, behind Inform. So if you're interested in snakes, I'm just saying, go there, <laughs> look for the snakes behind the, uh, the, the bangunan. We have all the different types of beautiful, beautiful butterflies. Yeah, so not just the ugly, but also the very beautiful. No idea how many species. Maybe you can find new species. That would be, would be fantastic. And we, we also have the hidden gems, orchids, all sorts of different other flowering plants. Often they don't flower for a very long time. So I put all of these photos, actually I should credit, I'm sorry, I forgot. All of these photos are made by Nji Muin. And uh, most of them are from the Eco Hub itself, right? And this flower is orchid, Eco Tupai. First time flowering in Eco Hub. When was that? I forgot to put the month. Do you remember when it was flowering? 
last month, last month. So and for orchids, sometimes many years we don't see them flowering, and then once they come out, is of course these hidden gems. It's very beautiful. Food, food for thought. We are all thinkers. That's why we're here. So we can get some of the produce if we are patient from also EcoHub. So got not just honey, um, but also stingless bee honey, and of course different types of plants. This is a durian from Durian Valley, right? But double makan. Tupai makan dulu. Okay. So next year, next year, next season. All right. Of course, we also have edible mushrooms, different types of, um, of fruits, edible fruits, chabai, chili, right? Unexpected visitors. Who, okay, hands up, who has seen these dusky langas on campus? Only Moon and I? <laughs> here, just exactly down here in EcoHub. Yeah, so they come in, they come out. They don't, stay, they don't stay permanently, and we haven't still understood exactly how they come in and out, I think. But very unexpected. So I think since more than one year already, two years? Two years. They, there's a small resident group of the dusky langas coming in and out. They're very nice, very docile, shy, don't have to be afraid. Um, yeah. Who is into birds? Someone interested in birds? So this is a very exciting uh, visitor as well. The Malay night heron made its first appearance after many years not coming in. It's a migrant species and actually all across Peninsular Malaysia also not very frequently sighted. Um, also very like uh, good camouflage, well camouflaged little birds, yeah, which for people who don't know much about birds like me, it's kind of like, okay. But for Nchimuin, it's like, oh my God, look at this. It's the eyebrow thrush. And it's, it's, a, it's rare, only sighted once in Ikoha before, in, in USM, sorry. And um, I think if the, the, the reason I'm showing you this is if you open your eyes, you see like so many different things. Hupue uh, came, how long and for two weeks? Stayed for two weeks. Did it try nesting here as well? Didn't nest. One individual. I know in Taiping they built a nest at the lake garden. So all the birders internationally from Japan, they all came and looked at the hupui. Um, this is the Eurasian one. The distribution shouldn't be until like here, like Penang or even down to Taiping. So it was quite a sighting actually when um, this bird came to visit us. Also, the bigger ones, the more also uh, intimidating looking ones, eagles and hawks, and also very exciting, I think, new record for USM just recently, the booted eagle, and many, many, many different more birds, 130 species according to Inchip Muin. He has his own book, I'm promoting it. Also, Nick Irwan, Dr. Nick has a book on spiders, right? Spiders in campus. Dr. Rosinda about the fungi and Dr. Rahmat, the coming soon. sorry, coming soon, coming soon. A bird. Okay, okay, guys. Okay. I'm not gonna say. Dr. Rahmat is coming soon. Gonna publish a book about uh, trees and plants on campus. All right. So open your eyes, go out, and just be really curious because there's there's so many things to explore. There's so many things to discover. And it is very colorful, it's very beautiful. And sometimes the ugly things are also very beautiful. And yeah, just never stop exploring. So that's it from me. Thank you very, very much. And yeah. Are there questions and answers? No questions. Okay, from the internet. So I would like to ask if you have any questions about biodiversity, about citizen science, about how we do this. <laughs> that is clear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It depends on the species, I guess. It, I can't say it's uh, it's going to be okay or not because I don't know the species or the context. But I'm just saying if you usually, if you have species you buy in the shop and then you put it in an aquarium, you should not...
put it back to nature, just because one thing is they might have really an issue of surviving, but the other one is if it's not a species that's inside, it's common inside that ecosystem, it might also lead to um, threatening other species in the ecosystem, invasive species. So if you have anything, jungle pasla pasla. Okay. Yeah, if it's if it's from here, it's fine. Then no problem. If the, it should be having good chances, but depending on where you the bus can and the water quality and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought you asked about whether you can put aquarium fish on iNaturalist. Well, you can if you put it as captivated, okay? <laughs> but we have also in School of Biological Science, we have big aquariums, so yeah, potentially can. Yeah, any more questions? I think it is. I mean, looking from the observations that we have made so far, or the students in, in the, um, the app that we have done earlier, I'm very surprised to see also new species being observed, and especially in terms of birds, and like you always have something new coming in. They, it's, it's nice. The biodiversity is really nice. And I have spoken to lecturers from other campuses, other universities, who have also suggested like a similar um, project and um, they said for us quite challenging in KL, the other upper bone. So I think here we're quite blessed still. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> Let's go. Naviki, Iko up. Yeah. Everyone already excited. I think it stopped raining, so. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you.